Tonight on This Week in Movies, new reviews of The Roommate and The Other Woman. We'll sit down with Winnebago Man director Ben Steinbauer. And because there's no big sporting events happening right now, we're sure to have record live viewers of all time. It's all coming up right now on This Week in Movies. Hi guys, welcome to This Week in Movies. You know where you can follow us, Twitter. Yep, that's right, TWI Movies. And we would also like to thank Storm on Demand for making our little show possible and remind everyone that you can download our show on iTunes for free, subscribe to the entire podcast, costs you nothing. And you can also watch us on our YouTube channel, youtube.com backslash This Week in Lon, I could care this much about the Super Bowl, but tell us what is happening. Who is winning? Uh, the, the Green Bay Packers right now are winning the game. I really was not watching the game very closely, but there were tons of movie ads. That, so I was, I was like waiting through the whole rest of the show to get to like Captain America and a bunch of the clips uh, from movies we haven't seen yet. What stood out? Was there any that were awesome? Well, I mean, you know, like the Transformers... The uh, Dark of the Moon trailer clearly stands out because it's just so huge. I mean, it's literally like battles taking places over entire cities and buildings exploding and Optimus Prime like slashing through whole streets full of cars. And it just looks like more of the over-the-top Michael Bay same. I've seen the trailer in theaters, and I have to say for the first 30 seconds or so of it, you I had no idea it was a You're Transformers movie. You're thinking of the teaser where it's the astronauts right, and they're right, on right, the moon. Right, yeah, yeah. This is a full oh, this trailer. Is full, oh, it opens with okay. Shia, and then you oh. hear a little bit of the plot, and then you see Optimus Prime, and it's the it's the whole, it's the first big trailer. Hmm. Uh, that one stood out just because of the, the scale of it. I think Super 8, though, to me, was the most exciting one to see, because we've never seen even a hint of what the movie's no. going to look like. Uh, that's of course, the J.J. Abrams directed, Steven Spielberg produced one that comes out this year. And what do you think? Uh, I think it looks cool. I mean, it, it's still very much a teaser, so it's impossible to tell. There's a kid, there's an alien invasion, you got Stanley Tucci in there for a second, hmm. but that's really all you get a feel for is just that it's going to be very big spectacle, something with aliens. Sci-fi. Sci-fi, monster kind of movie, mm -hmm. uh, but it definitely looks like it has that throwback Spielberg kind of feel because it's all young people. It's all like kids figuring out what to do during okay. the alien invasion. So. Huh. Definitely has like an 80s Spielberg vibe. Uh, the Captain America trailer was a lot of fun. Uh, first real footage you've seen of Chris Evans as Captain America. Lots of shirtlessness, so I'm sure you'll want to check of that course. out. Of course, that's uh, why else would I go see the movie? Yeah, and uh, and you need the uh, you, you get the you get the shield too. You get to see Captain America's shield in action ah. for the first time. And there were some other trailers for movies uh, we've seen bits for, like Rango and and Rio and. Um, or some of the others. Rango looks about. good, I have to say. I mean, I know. The animation thought, looks yeah, good. Yeah, the animation looked really good. And, and it's Johnny Depp, right? It's Johnny Which Depp I think and, is and Gore Verbinski directed, mm -hmm. who directed Depp did, in the and Mouse, Pirates of the Caribbean movies and, and Mouse, Mouse Hunt. Hunt. I like Mouse Hunt. The Ring, he did the American Ring. Yeah. Um, so, you know, it definitely has promise. Um, you know, I'm not, I'm not sure. It looks a little like WB cartoon, like how are they going to make this compelling for 90 minutes. I'm checking out your shirt but, today um, to see if there's any stains. Stay free. Stain, stain free, free. Last week, Lon was really ridiculed and perhaps a little unfairly so for having a stain on his poor sweatshirt. I shirt. think it was like... But now I literally am going to look at you every time and be like, is just do a quick he stain clean? Inspection. Are you clean? Yes. I'm very clean. I'm fastidious almost. Really? Well, that's good to know. You always yeah. smell very nice. Um, I do again. I, I'm, well, I'm glad to hear that you're smelling me. We will get into it later, but I, yeah. I should smell a little bit of fruit because, um, well, we have to talk about flavor lip gloss later on in the show. Right. I was actually going to say, I think a good new slogan for our show might be, This Week in Movies, earlier time, more reviews, fewer soup stains. So in the future, <laughs> you know. True. We'll make, it, make it fun. Yeah, I like it. Uh, we have a really very, very cool guest tonight. Ben Steinbauer is here. He directed the documentary Winnebago Man. He's in town in California from Austin for just a few days, and he's making the time to come visit our little show. So we're very excited about that. He made this documentary about the angriest man in the world, a Winnebago salesman. So he's going to tell us what Jack Rebney is really like. Mm. Uh, but before all that, we have some movies to talk about. Should we get into in theaters? Let's jump in. Let's move on.
So our first film was actually the number one film this weekend. There was a there was a bigger, I feel like a higher profile you movie. You so knew this was going to be number one, didn't I, you? I did not. Oh, I, thought I absolutely Sanctum. thought. I oh, thought, God. I thought it had James Cameron's name on it in the trailer. It was 3D. Because, you know, the 3D movies, they can charge more, I know, too. but it looks so bad. It I looks, mean. It looks a little dull. I agree. But um, I, anyway. And the reviews were terrible. Anyway, for the most I part. had expected that to be number one. But instead, number one was our film that we're talking about right now, The Roommate. Uh, an aspiring fashion fashion designer named Sarah bonds with her college roomie, the eccentric artist Rebecca, before discovering that her new best friend has sort of a dark side. Let's take a look at a clip from the trailer. I'm her only friend. This is your home? It was never a home when I lived here. Rebecca's doing really well. She's doing good. She's taking her medication. Medication? <laughs> Rebecca, something is up with your roommate. What do you mean? So, I mean, I think the 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 the, be the easiest shorthand I could give for this movie, if you haven't seen it, it's an it almost scene for scene redo of single white female, but for the CW set. I mean, there yes. are literally whole scenes that are taken directly from single white female. Yes, it's itself what, not that memorable. You movie. have to remember that. You know the the audience that this was made for. There's a very very good chance they never saw single white female. Oh, I'm, I'm We're, sure. I'm I sure mean, they didn't. so the, the the story was ripe for a retelling, and the fact that it's it it, it could be scene for scene um, replication because no one cares because this. They haven't even seen the first one, and if right. they did, who cares? I mean, it's still, yeah. like you said, it is made for a tween set where a single white female may have geared a little older. bit towards well, an audience. It was but Bridget Fonda and Jennifer Jason yeah. Leigh, and even though it was in the 90s, they were still, they were in their 30s True. at that point. So this is for a younger group. I, I mean, I think the biggest problem with it um, and it's you know it is what it is. I mean you can you can judge from that trailer. It is what it get. is, and it's so good at being oh, that. Please. I it's fully not enjoyed good. myself. It's, it it's, is it's good aiming for sleazy trash. It's like, aiming it's for uh, it's aiming for amazeballsness, and it really achieves even, it on it, like a like an eight to ten scale. It's not like even it's trying to be good. It's just trying to be sleazy and how, trashy. But uh, the problem is that because it's PG thirteen, right? It can really not get sleazy it was too and trashy chaste. Like it I, to. who went to Catholic school, actually found it too chaste. I thought okay. Well, it is geared towards this audience. I expected a lot more sex. I mean, everything was very tame it's, in it's terms of the very, nudity there's, sex department. There's, there's a couple scenes that are trying to be sexy, and you can feel them but trying to be sexy. But they're not even making out. One, there's there's not, one, no there's shirts a shower, come off. There's a shower scene where you just, like, they creatively cut around seeing any nudity. But and when then there's a masturbation scene, and then there's a but sex it's scene. Not it, there's not much to it. To yeah, to nothing's ha even when she, well, even when Minka Kelly gets together with um, Cam G Giagade, Giagade, yeah. or whatever. You, I mean, they barely even show them kissing. I mean, I was a god. No, I mean, it really, is, it is, it's it, bizarre. It's surprisingly chaste. It, it at times reminded me of if you're trying to watch like a like a softcore movie, but on <laughs> TNT, and they have to cut I don't out. Really all the, to watch and, they, and they have to movies, cut out all the good stuff. So uh, David yeah. Spade used to do a joke in his uh, stand-up act where it was like watching those movies where it's like, "Hey guys, look, it's a boob festival. Let's go." Cuts a commercial. Well, that was a great boob festival. <laughs> it's like it, it has, feel like that it has a little that little bit. feeling of it keeps promising you you're going to see. something And there is kinda... a lesbian kiss. However, it's there's no tongue. It's quite short. It's yeah. sexy, but it's not. It's, um, it's, you it's, know, it's not. And it overplays its hand too early, too. So by the second half, you've seen Leighton Meester be about as scary as she can manage. True. So it becomes a joke. Like, the audience I was in was all the target demo for yeah. this movie. And by the second half, you would cut to, and you see it in the trailer, you would cut to her, like, staring at someone from across the room. And there it would get laughs because they overuse it in the beginning. And then by the end, she's not really scary that anymore. That said, it has sort of everything. It has the shower scenes. It has <laughs> a lesbian everything. kiss. It has a, ca a girl fight. It reminded me a little bit of that Idris Elba. A Beyonce, Ali Larder movie, Obsessed. Yes, where that was better. It's that campy, was better fun. at being trashy and hokey and campy than this movie. Did all, yeah, did all of the close-ups bother you? I it, this to me felt a little bit like a commercial for lip gloss. There were so <laughs> many close-up yes. shots of lips and lip gloss, and everyone's face was shot like this. I mean, I thought they almost could have been yeah. on a green screen we, practically. We should, I feel like we've we've already run this topic. The guy. Two more things I want to very quickly mention before we move on. Mm -hmm. One is I found a little bit of the subtext of the film a little homophobic. There's a little bit like, 
part of her eccentricity is the fact that she might be a lesbian. No, and I didn't see that at all. And a couple characters make an issue of it, like, oh, I think she likes you, wink. And it's like, why, that, why would that be so strange if she liked her? Because if I had a girlfriend that uh, people thought maybe was romantically interested in me, yeah, people might say that. There's no, it, you're, it was playing that it you're as, like looking it was for some sort of deeper being a lesbian, meaning. It was some creepy, and then there's another lesbian who is like punished for being a lesbian. She's not in the punished for being film. lesbian. She's punished because she's threatening the friendship that she, no, she, she's friends. There's a lesbian scene where a, a one lesbian picks up on another, yeah. and then that turns out to be a horrible tragedy that causes them to be tormented. The only the only reason she's targeted is because she's friends with Minka Kelly and, and Leighton Meester feels threatened by her. It's not because she's a lesbian. There's, there was a little bit of that. No. I thought it was a little creepy on no. one level that they were asking uh, young people to sort of find, like, oh, aren't these lesbians strange and weird and creepy? No, and I feel like they were like, isn't this hot and sexy? And the other thing was, no. well, but that's another way of stereotyping. Like, oh, aren't these I lesbians exotic and sexy? I did not see that at all. Uh, and then there's the other thing that bothered me. You mentioned him already. Cam Gigandet or Gigandet. I think it's Giagage from Twilight is <laughs> arguably the worst actor I've seen in a film in probably two, three years. He does this thing in every single shot where he kind of half smirks and then squints, and it's that's not That's acting. his face, sweetie. But that's how that, he but looks. But he does that. It's like he's being terrified and almost murdered versus he's picking up on a girl at a party. His facial expressions and his demeanor do not change. The Twihards are going to come after you big time. I mean, let them. The, this thing, yeah, he's in the OC. They're saying in the chat room, he is This terrible. was a there who's who of TV people. The Wildcats, 90210. Our friend uh, Matt Lantern. Uh, Friday Night Lights. Yeah, Friday, well? if you like Matt Lanter, go back and watch one of our older episodes. We did a nice long interview with Matt Lanter. He makes a little, he has it's a little small a role. In this, it yeah. is practically him. But it, this was a who's who of TV shows. It Me, really even Minka was. Kelly, Friday and, Night Lights. None of these, I'm not trying to call out any of these young actors, yeah. but everybody was fine except this one guy, Cam, whatever, who is. He didn't bother me terrible. at all. And he was in, um, in the, uh, Bar no, I want to say Bardot, uh, Burlesque. He was the male lead in Burlesque. Somehow I managed to miss that one. <laughs> uh, the last thing, uh, they, they do kind of hint that they're going going for camp, and I wish they would go more in that. They cast Billy Zane as a fashion uh, oh, professor. Right. Yeah. And as soon as you cast Billy Zane in a role like that with the scarves and the silly hats, and you're almost telling, you're, you're tipping your hand to the audience, this is supposed to be funny. But and it, it is wasn't, sort it of funny. It wasn't fun enough. I, it was super fun. It wasn't sexy enough. I had enough, a good time. My audience was enough, cheering. And it wasn't fun enough. It was perhaps not trashy enough in a sexual way. But yeah. other than that, I think it completely delivered. I think it. it I think Screen Gems is deserves props. They know exactly how to market a movie to these teen kids, and it played. It played well. I think it, you know, Leighton did these viral videos and on, for college humor websites and stuff. I think. I think it achieved exactly what it set out to do. I had fun. My audience had fun. Do you know who Minka Kelly is dating in real life? Yeah. Derek Jeter. How can you not know that? It's a sports one. Because I don't pay attention. You pay well, zero attention that's the only to movie Us I know Weekly. What do you know about than celebrity romance is sports, professional sports? <gasps> what do you know about movies? Movies. <laughs> <laughs> but see, I Look expand the the my horizons to celebrities and movies. Mm. This is a much okay. more intellectual fair, fair uh, thing. Okay, so let's move on let's to move on. a far different film. Um, I feel like I need to have a box of tissues out for this review. Uh, the other really? woman, Natalie Portman, plays a pregnant newlywed who is married to her boss who she met while he was still married and when their baby dies she has to learn to come to terms with her grief as well as dealing with her relationship with her new stepson a bitter ex-wife and her own uh, sort of Mm, strained relationship with her father. It co-stars Scott Cohen and Lisa Kudrow. It's directed by Don Ruse. Let's take a look. I'm married. Is that okay? As long as you don't say they've never done this before and you're afraid of hurting your wife. I've never done this before and I'm afraid of hurting my wife. Will, this is Amelia. Pleased to meet you. Pleased to meet you too. <laughs> to Amelia and Jack, may their marriage be long and fruitful. I'm so happy that you're expecting. <laughs> I can barely think about what I want to say about this movie because I'm so curious well, what you thought. The first thought. thing I want to say is, I, I think we need a moratorium, the bad choice of words, on dead baby <laughs> movies. <laughs> oh, what do you mean? A month with Rabbit Hole, and now this, I feel like it's nothing but dead babies at the Cineplex. And actually, the mo the theater where this was playing in the other screen was Rabbit Hole. It's just it's like, true. everybody working here must want to slit their wrists. I really feel like this so easily could have become a Lifetime Movie of the Week film, and it really didn't. It, I couldn't believe how much I liked it. I oh, thought this wow. was so good. I, I thought Scott Cohen was 
such an interesting choice oh, and what? so good. And I thought, Natalie, I'm kind of over her. First of all, how many movies did this girl make last year? But she did a really good job, and I really liked how many different relationships you were watching. You're watching, you know, what it's like for a stepmom to come in. You're watching a second marriage. You're watching, you know, the relationship with her own father. I thought it really did a good job of, it's not just a one-note story, and I was particularly surprised that Don Ruse did it because he did that other movie with Lisa Kudrow, which I liked a lot, uh, The Opposite of the Sex. Opposite of sex but yeah. it was super funny and quirky, and this yeah. is heavy drama, and is, I'm impressed thing, by him. The one thing they do have in common, both of those films, is Lisa tissue, Kudrow. Well, the, the Lisa Kudrow, but it's it's the dialogue. It's very it's very snappy, and even though this film is very dark and very grim, mm. Natalie Portman's character is actually You're quite right, she's witty. witty, yes, well exactly, spoken. which I liked. I liked that. That was probably my favorite element of I the film. I was surprised that all the stuff was coming out of her mouth, and she right. was kind of obnoxious and sarcastic and to this eight-year-old or 11-year-old really, boy, which was at fun. At times, it almost reminded me of, like, Juno in mm. her 30s. She mm -hmm. has, like, a quirky way of talking, or in mm -hmm. her late 20s, I guess. Quirky, interesting way of talking and an interesting perspective on the world. The scenes with her and the stepson, who, uh, Charlie Tahan, or Tahan mm -hmm. is the actor, those scenes are great. If yes. you could make a edit together a movie of it's just about this woman who's just lost her baby right. and now she is forming this relationship with this oh. eight year old that she's living with I thought that stuff was really interesting I was not as crazy about the other relationships I felt like all of them felt like not fully fleshed the out the one with the father was perhaps not but I actually because thought there were, there, were, uh, like the, 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 the there were a the lot father, of scenes with her and that little boy I mean that was to me the crux no, and, of the movie and, and it so. is and when the movie is about that relationship mm -hmm. it works very well and, mm -hmm. and it, I just thought it distracts itself with sort of unnecessary stuff. I mean, I think you could cut out one whole plot strand mm. and it would still be fine. Like, you don't need the Lisa Kudrow character or you don't oh, need but the she, dad. I feel like she provides... Oh, you do. Well, the Lisa Kudrow's character, I mean, to... To a certain extent, I thought she was a little overplayed. I mean, it's she's very such overplayed. a shrew, but the things that come out of her mouth are so awful, and they are they almost provide a level of humor. I mean, they're awful, so you're not really laughing, but she nailed it. I mean, what an unappealing character to play, and I thought she did such a it, good it job is. with and, it. And she's that, so mean to her. And you sense that that character is meant to be sort of a, a parody of, like, these idle, rich Manhattanites mm -hmm. who they pamper the kids, they take everything too seriously. And, and I, I just I felt like we've seen that critique before, and it would be more inside if it was less over the top. Like, she's so maniacal. She's so, yes. It's and a little it, hard to believe. It reminded but, me of Tealioni in Spanglish where it's like uh, dialing it down yeah. would actually make it more effective. That is a very good believable. comparison, my little cupcake. Thank you. That was good. Uh, the um, one, the one other thing I thought about that I want to mention before, you know, we you, you like you it when I call you cupcake. Uh, Anthony Rapp from Rent is yeah, in this, bizarre. playing his same character. Yeah, he's typecast. He just cast. took the scarf off. And it was weird. And he's doing the exact same line delivery. It's a very distracting if you've seen the film or the play Rent. Yeah. Because you keep picturing Mark from Rent. To be honest, I think you and I are probably very, I think 98% of the audience would never know that that's Anthony Rapp uh, or know seen, that he was in Rent. If you've seen Rent, you'd immediately go, why is Mark from Rent in this scene mm, talking to Lauren But Ambrose? that's like saying an actor can't be in a movie and in no, a play. He's playing, I mean, he's playing the exact same role. I mean, he's doing it. Mm. I, he's delivering the lines identically. A little bit. Did yeah. you like Scott Cohen? Did you think he was? Because first I'm like, yeah. he's way too old. He doesn't look you right with her. But then read my he really. I Cohen thought, is the weakest link. No, here. no. Yeah. He, they. I thought the fights in this movie, the fights between Lisa Kudrow and Natalie Portman, but particularly the fights between, you know, she's she's a newlywed and they've lost their baby and and now their marriage is really. Strange. I thought their fights and the way he dealt with her was great. It felt so real. This movie really? felt I so didn't, authentic to me. I didn't really find me. them to be a very believable couple. Oh, I There's did. With they them and their grooming. arms around each other, and you feel like I don't really get a sense these people have like a history together. And he just, he, it felt like John Hamm light. It felt like mm. he was trying to do like a Don Draper. I thought he did a very good job. He looks like John Hamm, but he's not, he doesn't have the. Uh, he Listen, this movie was two hours, and I was never bored. I was really, I, I was really into it. And I, don't I, think, I don't think it's a bad film. I think if you could, like I said, th and Natalie Portman is, it delivers yet a more interesting, I mean, this is an interest. She brings a lot to this character, don't she, you think? She does, well, she does, and like I said, I think I think her character is better than the film she's in. I think mm. opposite of sex, you could almost say that too. Like mm. the Christina Ricci character is, such a great, is yeah. more interesting than the film she's in. Yeah, and I think that's probably true of this one. Those two characters, her and the son or the stepson, uh -huh. they're more interesting than this movie. Like <laughs> I would rather see them leave this plot and go on an adventure together, Let me and ask, not have to worry about the rest. Did of Did you like uh, what I what one of the things I really enjoyed was how the movie unfolds in terms of 
how you find out about how they got together, how the baby died, why the baby yeah, died. I liked how they told you. They I, give you little bits of information all the way through the movie. I thought it was a very good those, way of telling it's it. It's one of the cases where you can tell Ruse has a long history as a screenwriter. Mm. He's, he's very economical. It's very efficiently told, especially the first half hour. There is a ton of information condensed yes. into a few scenes. And, uh, he, you know, obviously, like, the more you write screenplays, you get yeah. better at stuff like that. True. And he's very good at economy of storytelling mm -hmm. and getting all of his characters out there and it's a very labored complex I mean it's based on a novel a uh, little trivia for it did you know that it's based on a novel by Ayala Waldman who uh -huh. is married to Michael Shabon another novel I did not know she was married to him see there you go oh my god but you know what my Minka Kelly Derek Jeter is way more interesting yeah fair enough um, but I will say collegiate I, anyone who lives in New York City will appreciate this movie there's great New York City scenery and collegiate I will I'm very proud of my little brother because he went he to got, collegiate he got in he got in he got into collegiate. My brother's smart. That was he. He gets rejected in the movie, but that made me happy. And it was nice seeing Walman Rink. I mean, it was. I don't know what the budget for this movie was, but I think I expected it to be really lame. And I was so so pleasantly surprised. And I think you liked it more than you care to admit. I mean, I don't. I don't think it was a bad film, but I think it, it is flawed. And and when it's a movie like this that is small and is going to be dependent on word of mouth, that basically means I think. Did it's you probably like the other disappear. woman better than the roommate? Oh yes. I enjoyed watching The Other Woman much, huh. much more than The Roommate. Interesting. Because The Other Woman is, here's the thing, The Other Woman is honest to itself. It is what yes. it is. It wanted to be a dramatic, family, art house, sort of funny, but only in a very sort of gallows humor kind of drama, mm -hmm. character study about this woman, and it is that. Yes. The Roommate wants to be this, like, dangerous, naughty, sexy, like, right. MTV skins, and it's just as hard isn't in it. It's it's too milk toast for that. I thoroughly enjoyed myself. <laughs> uh, okay, let's move on to our Please. Netflix streaming segment. Look at that! Graphics! Exciting! I love graphics on screen. Um, you want to start us off? Sure. Uh, I'm talking about, it's a 1991 film. Uh, David Mamet wrote and directed it. Uh, it stars Joe Mantegna, William H. Macy, and Ving Rhames. Great cast in this one. Hmm. Uh, it is, unfortunately, only in 4x3. It's full screen on Netflix. I hate when they do that because mm. it is a widescreen film. You get the DVD, it's in widescreen. Uh, but having said that, I like this movie so much, it is worth sitting through the full screen presentation. Uh, it's called Homicide. Uh, the setup, a non-religious Jewish detective is proceeding with two simultaneous investigations. He's on a manhunt for a cop killer who has escaped, who's played by Ving Rhames, and he is investigating a murder at a convenience store of an old Jewish woman, which may or may not have been uh, rooted in anti-Semitism. Let's take a look at a quick scene. This is when Mantegna first arrives at the crime scene and finds the old Jewish woman's body. Hmm. Go to the store next door. They got an office. Tell them we're taking it as a command post. Everybody's names. Everybody goes downtown. Yes, sir. What do we got? We got a homicide. And there's a very pretty 45 Colt in there. I don't want to see disappearing in some cop's locker. So tag it first, okay? Gotcha. Wait a minute. All right, sir. Would you like to come in for a moment? And please, while you're in the store, touch nothing. There's nothing to see here, folks. Why don't you go home? It never stops. It never stops, does it? It never stops. What is it that never stops? Against the Jews. So uh, one, one theme I think that comes up in my recommendations of films on the show a lot is thrillers that also have another element going on. They lure you in by being just interesting, intriguing, and, and compelling thriller mm -hmm. stories and then there's another level that the story is working on um, Dirty Pretty Things the Stephen Frears one is a recent example mm. of a movie I love and it's it's a thriller nominally they're, they're sort of caught up in this organ thieving uh, right. scam but it's really about the immigrant experience in London Andy Garcia and Kurt Russell they're cops and like, but then there's the romance with his wife the that's happening at the same sunrise? time no no no, no 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 it's like unbreakable or un can't, you can't get in something about can't getting in don't break Unlawful in like, entry. there we go but that's not Andy is that Andy that's really Garcia, right, really right. Oda. But that had like the romantic thing going on as well as like a plot. Like you just yeah, like but two that's not, stories. There's really not. There's really not like a more thoughtful level to, to unlawful entry. I mean, it's not a bad film. It's a great um, film. But it's really just about being like a pulpy genre movie. As was, I, by the way, To Kill a Sunrise was oh, very incredible. Pulpy. Very, the very, best very, movie perhaps ever. But, oh um, my God, Michelle. But I, I like I like films like like this one too, um, where it's really about. Uh, it's about what it what it sort of means to be racist and anti-Semitic on hmm. one level. That that the main character Joe Mantegna, he's Jewish. He doesn't self-identify as being anti-Semitic or racist, and yet you know he'll use racial slurs if someone makes him angry. And he's got this built-in uh, sort of 
you know, uh, apathy about Jews who complain about being the victims of intolerance. He's like, mm -hmm. oh, they're just paranoid. They're just making it up. And so this is, you know, uh, it's really about that and about how our perceptions of race inform so much of what we do, aside from just being overtly grandstandingly racist. Like, we think of racist people are right. like evil, vitriolic in your face, and this is like, no, everybody has certain predispositions and prejudices mm -hmm. that are just lurking under the surface. Uh, and, but and, there's and so, a story going on at the same, like a plot. Right. Like no, it's, a whole... it's, a, it's a police procedural mm -hmm. all the way. It's really about cop work and maintaining... Did this come out and, in theaters? Yeah, it was a, it was a theatrical film. Uh, it's really about, you know, Mantegna and William H. Macy, who are the partners, and they're investigating these two crimes, and Mantegna feels very pulled because he's been working on the Ving Rhames case forever, and then this other case comes up and he doesn't really want it but they want him because he's Jewish and so he kind of gets pulled into mm. it and so it's really about the tension between those two cases and just what they do to solve the cases there's just this thread that runs underneath it that's yeah. really about his approach and why is he so much more eager to go for this one case than the other and it's what they call the B story instincts? right it, well it's the subtext there's, so, con yeah. there's mm -hmm. the context and the subtext but um, it's really fascinating and I won't give any spoilers but it really builds Mamet's known for his like great final yeah. twisty scenes and this builds to one of his best all time climaxes the last really? two or three scenes of this movie are just... Does it have that signature away. mammoth, like that constant back and forth it, it dialogue? It definitely does. It. And, and, sometimes and, that drives me crazy. Other times it's well done. Well, but. Macy and Mantegna both uh, came up as actors in at the Atlantic Theater Company with Mammoth. Uh, so they've been performing Mammoth dialogue since the 70s. Mm. And I mean, if you've got two guys on Earth who are better able to work with those kind of lines... Is Rebecca Pigeon guys. in it? She is. You saw her in that clip. Of course. I, she's in every freaking she's one of his movies. She's the granddaughter of the, of the woman who's murdered, yes. But she's, she's great. She's great in this movie. This in Spanish Prisoner, I think, probably her two best I love Spanish performances Prisoner. in Mammoth films. That was Spanish great. Prisoner, obviously one of his best. Yeah. Yes. Um, okay, good. I will add it to my queue. Please do. I pretty much add everything you say to my queue. Does that make you feel good? It does. Do you add things that I recommend to your queue? <laughs> So moving on, uh, a wedding. <laughs> tell Unbelievable! Us, tell us a bit you are no, just. I'm I'm I totally get no kidding. love. I you really, I as many fully. Streaming movies I as recommend I do. everything. That's not true. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> I don't recommend this, everything, but I, re I do recommend streaming. All right. Well, you, you have, and I have watched movies based on your recommendations. Okay, before. good. Um, <laughs> we were just talking about one like two, three weeks ago that you had suggested that I something with Amanda Peet, perhaps. Probably. I saw her a again lot today. Like love. I sat through that one. You did sit through it, but it was for it was for a bet. It was for uh, Halloween. But so, uh, okay. Well, moving on, a, a different kind of film. Uh, I'm going to talk about a wedding, which is streaming. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a 1978 Robert Altman satire about the. Wedding Rituals and the American Family. The movie follows 48 characters over the course of one day of a high society wedding and it basically turns into a dysfunctional family nightmare. The cast includes people like Lauren Hutton, Pam Dauber, Carol Burnett, Paul Dooley, and Mia Farrow. Uh, let's take a look. I think this movie is delightful. I really, it is just, if you are a fan of Altman, you will like this movie because it is all of his signature things. The overlapping dialogue, the you know, a multitude of characters, the over-the-head, you know, camera shots where you're watching a scene, you're like not even really sure what person you're supposed to focus on, and I, the melodramatic music. I mean, it's so over the top, and yet what he achieves is it doesn't turn into farce. It really is satire, and I think it would have played wonderfully as a play as well. And he's telling basically seven different stories with 48 different characters. There is gay lovers, there is affairs, there is a car crash, there is a death. Uh, there's the wedding, and, and, and all of it somehow seamlessly interacts. If you're, and you just, you kind of have to always be paying attention because everyone's talking, and you don't really know what's what you need to be focusing on. And truthfully, there is really no plot. This is a day in the life of a bunch of people that have gathered and converged on this, you know, house yeah. for a wedding, and they all have agendas, and a lot of them have secrets, and it's watching it all play out. Carol Burnett is really so funny in this, and she was nominated for a Golden Globe nomination for her role. She plays the bride 
Bride's mother. And my favorite character, because there are so many, first of all, it's like, what is Lauren Hutton doing in this movie? That's and true, why yes. is Mork and Mindy, why is Mindy in this movie? But and she's uh, credited as Pamela Dawn. Pamela. In the because opening, she's which is Pamela. Um, I love Paul Dooley. He played the dad in 16 Candles, and he's such a good dad. I want, I, like, I think he would have been he's, a great dad. He's one of those character actors that is so fantastic in dozens of films, mm. and everybody knows him. If you see a picture of him, yeah, I, did, like, I did not know who Paul Dooley is. Yeah, but that guy. Can yes. Paul Dooley. Yeah. And Mia Farrow does not utter a single word throughout the entire movie, even though she is one of, if not the main character, and she plays a whore. She's a slut, and I love it. Mia Farrow as a slut and a mute. I mean, it was really just sort of, the whole thing is so bizarre and yet kind of genius, and I really enjoyed it. Yeah, it's, it's one of those movies. I mean, Altman... It's dated, though. Let me. It is definitely oh, dated. A little bit. I mean, in the way a lot of, you know, sort of Altman stuff is, but he's one of those filmmakers where within the first five minutes of the movie, there is, there, it's, it's sort of intangible, but there's a confidence behind it. There's a certainty of vision. He's mm -hmm. going in and he knows what the movie is. Yes. And he's been making movies for so long, he knows exactly Exactly how to get this movie to fit that get these situations to fit into the format. I would say in the same vein as Mammoth, I really admire, I think my favorite thing is in Scorsese, I love directors that have a vision. You go into their movies and there's just a certain feel and, and that just, is so signature to them. And But Altman's is perhaps one of the most unique of all you know, of them. But you, just, you know that you can give yourself over to it. You don't mm. have to worry about, am I following? Is this go? you know, yeah. is, am I bored by this? What's happening? How's the pacing? You just know it's going to be good and you should just give yourself over to it and he's going to take you on an interesting journey. Right. Sure enough, he does. And and while I was watching this again, I'd seen this years ago, but I rewatched it this week. And while I was watching it again, I was struck by how many other films, even recent films, have tried to do this like everything goes wrong at a wedding, like death at a funeral. Yes. With something like not just a wedding because but everything, everything usually everything does. Everything goes wrong yeah. at like a big family yeah. event. It's become such a sort of tired genre by now and this is really one of the sort of but the reason it the comes genre. tired is because people studios these kinds of movies do so well people love going to wedding movies it's right. just been proven that's why they keep well, remaking them it's but it's universal Everybody's what I like been about wedding. you know four weddings and a funeral and my best friend's wedding and if you love wedding movies you will love this movie if you cannot stand wedding movies and you're planning your own wedding and you hate big weddings you will also love this movie in a way it splits the audience because it is poking fun at it it's pointing out how ludicrous it all is and how annoying everyone the, can be and right, it, it, it plays both it sides equally so you're like I love this it's a wedding movie and oh my god I never want to get married it, yeah. it's just and and, uh, yeah. and and done with the same sort of you know mastery and, and, and wit and just careful attention to detail of all of the and great, a great ending Alman, just Nashville subtle and subtle and ending Mrs. Miller and Brewster McCloud they've been mentioning great Mammoth oh not Mammoth Altman films in the uh, in the chat room mm. uh, the player the and player. it's tempting to just you know what delve in what was the one with Kate Hudson it was not very good and Helen Hunt it was more of one of his more Dr. recent T ones. Yeah. yeah, yeah, not, that was not, one, not of one of his stronger ones. Towards the end of his career, I mean, he made some great ones near the end. Um, Gosford Park is amazing, mm. and, and in this same vein of very complicated, massive ensemble, yeah. eighteen different storylines going on at once, but it all holds together and it all works. And he's yeah. he's got you. You always just get that feeling. It like, made I me got appreciate it, I got the fact it. that like there's so many movies that come out where there's two stories, maybe three, kind of going on, and yet they don't really deliver any well. And this guy's telling like nine different stories, and you are actually able to follow all of them. Can, you develop a bond of pretty much a lot of the characters. Yeah. Even Desi Arnaz Jr. is in this movie. It really. Times, what's fun about watching these older films is you spend a lot of time staring at the scene and thinking. Who am I going to see now? Like, who am I going to recognize that yeah. was a nobody back then? Because with 48 have characters. Have you seen Cabin Miller? You no, check them out. I don't Warren think I Beatty have. And Julie Christie. It's a western. I love, but Altman oh, did it I hate in this, westerns. But Altman did it in this. It's not a wet. Like they're not riding around the okay. rain shooting engines. It's like <laughs> it's a it's a real you know domestic story. It's it's a. Uh, yeah, anyway, I'll, okay, I'll, I would like basically, it. Uh, a, a, a wealthy guy in the Old West teams up with a madam, and they open a brothel together in a huh. small Western town. And it's Warren Beatty and Julie well, I love Christie. Julie Christie, so it's, then it's I would like it. It's a fantastic movie, and it's done in the same style of, you get a real sense for the whole community that's formed because you get to know everybody, uh -huh. and it's like these scenes in saloons where there's a hundred people talking at once, and you're just kind of zooming through the entire I did setting. I did really, really like True Grit, so I feel like I'm changing my tune a little bit on Westerns, but How it's just you? it's this genre. Horror an and Westerns, I really don't like the 
them. Horror. I watch Shane. I've seen them. I'll tell I just you, really don't like I them. I will allow, but you can't be an American movie fan and not La- love westerns. It's our genre. Uh, Cupcake, it's our you're not genre. the boss of me. <laughs> you're not allowed to not, not like westerns. You okay. have, you, you, I, I insist that you get into westerns. I'm going to bring in somebody nicer to sit next to me. How about that? Well, fair enough. Um, hopefully he'll be nice to me. <laughs> I'm hoping Ben Steinbauer urges you to watch more westerns <laughs> because they're great. He's going to encourage me to watch documentaries. That's what he's well, going to say. Well, they're great, too. Um, ben had, has directed this movie, When a Bagel Man, which I reviewed a few weeks back. It basically chronicles his search for whatever happened to Jack Rebney, the angriest man in the world. This was a Winnebago salesman who became famous and, you know, pretty much a YouTube sensation when outtakes from his 1989 Winnebago sales tape went viral. Let's take a look. All right, here we go. The Winnebago concepts and engineering departments have developed a multifunctional bathroom. Privacy, I don't even know what the f- I'm reading. I'm going to slate this f***ing 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 you big dumb son of a I don't want any more bull from anyone. That includes me. I love this clip. I watch it like every time I'm in a bad mood. Oh, I've seen this like hundreds of times. This guy's a legend. Yep. Make my mind work. <laughs> Dad Rebney would be the holy grail of stars to meet from these videos. We could never find him, so we just assumed he was gone. You start to think, well, who is this guy? What happened to him? That's weird. There's no property. There's no cars. There's no voter registration. What does that mean? You don't want anybody to really know who you are and what you're about. This is Jack Rebney. It's inconceivable to me that you would have any interest in this, but if you want to talk, I'm interested. Hello, I'm Jack Rebney. I'm known as the angriest man on earth. Kutrama that you will need. A Kutrama? What is this? <laughs> We're chit chatting about the uh, downside of Los Angeles. Uh, welcome, Ben. Thank you for Thank doing you. us the kindness of coming to our little show while you're in town. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. Um, let me just ask you off the bat when. How did you go make the decision to make this film? How do you go from watching this, these clips on YouTube and laughing to thinking, I'm actually going to make a whole documentary about this guy and find out whatever happened to him? Yeah, I know. It makes me sound a little bit like an internet stalker or something like that. Um, I'm not saying that, well, but, you know. People have. <laughs> um, and it really it was just about the context. Like when I um, initially got interested in, in trying to find Jack, it was around 2004, 2005, mm-hmm. when um, Star Wars kids' parents were suing the parents of the kids who put his clip up online. Uh-huh. And they settled out of court for a quarter of a million dollars, and that's where the term cyberbullying actually comes from, was that case. Hmm. And so this notion of um, us being out of control, maybe, of our uh, like digital reputations and having... Um, I, I got really taken with the idea that no matter what poor Star Wars kid goes on to do with his life, yeah. he's going to forever be known as the Star Wars kid. Right. And that would affect who he dates, where he lives, mm-hmm. what job he gets. Um, and so I... And that he had no control over that fate, which is... And if, particularly when it's such a young... Something like that happens to such a young kid. Right. It doesn't, it doesn't seem fair. Absolutely. And he was 15. I mean, can you imagine like that hazing on sort of this global mm-hmm. scale? Yeah. And it was really the first instance of that. And, and um, the, the initial research I started to do... Um, in thinking like, well, I wonder what happened to the star of my favorite viral video, Jack Rebney, uh, led me to believe that he was actually really scarred, just like the Star Wars kid was. Mm-hmm. And I, that deeply saddened me. It's, it sounds so idealistic and almost slightly naive to say, but I um, realized that, that he could be embarrassed or injured as a result of this clip. And I really wanted to show him that to my friends and I, he was like a Rodney Dangerfield type character. He was somebody who we quoted, whose um, who's sort of stand-up routine we watched over and over. And That by and watching it, you were not laughing at him, but you were sort of... He was a hero to you. That yeah. It was well, and it, you know, it's it's tempting to say like, were you laughing at or laughing with? Yeah. I think it goes beyond that. Yeah. It's like you know, the the point it seems of a lot of the new technology is to connect and to instantly meet new people. And but you know what it what it often serves to do is to physically separate all of us. And mm. so 
in this sort of strange way, these clips that were never supposed to exist in the first place. <laughs> through, right. Through like, you know, getting dubbed on VHS tape and passed hand to hand and then uploaded to YouTube actually sort of brought and me And had together. YouTube and the internet not been part of our lives, this guy would have disappeared. I mean, it, yeah. I mean, people were, as you said, passing around this VHS tape. However, that's still a limited audience and right. the internet is just a whole different story. How, how challenging was it to make this documentary and how long did it take you to make? Well, it was extremely challenging because when you try and raise money for something like this and you go to investors and you say, um, well, we don't know if the main character is going to let us to continue filming. Uh, I don't exactly know what the ending is going to be. And I'm not even sure that he's alive at the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> They're just like, uh, good luck. You know, we'll see you later. So uh, the, the funding was certainly an issue, and I had to self-finance the majority of the film. Um, and then the, the time, actually, it didn't take that long in the sort of grand scheme of mm -hmm. documentary filmmaking. From, from start to finish was about three years. And I that's, see. That's pretty average. But the, the And was this your full-time job, or you were working, you know, in Starbucks on the side to pay for well, your film? <laughs> well, not Starbucks, exactly. I have a production company in Austin, and we make commercials and music videos, mm -hmm. and um, I work on other films. And... Um, uh, and, and with something like this, like we didn't shoot full time at all. Okay. But when we got to the editing phase, it was definitely full time, and it's been full time ever since. One of the things that I loved about the movie is, is like you said, that you cover not just Jack's Jack's case, but you mentioned the Star Wars kids, and you sort of talk about what this whole phenomenon of the YouTube and what it can do to people's lives on a personal level, which frankly. I really had not given much thought until I saw your movie, and it is it was really heartbreaking to me. As you said, when I started to think about, oh my God, this is so unfair, what could happen to somebody, and how little control you have. Um, but you have a few meetings with Jack over the course of the movie, but what I also liked is you also interviewed the um, the, the crew that shot the sales tape. Right. So what surprised you most uh, in, in talking and interviewing those guys? Oh, that's a really good question. Um... Well, one of my favorite parts from, from the, that interview that's actually in the film is a guy uh, whose name is Nick Danger, which is like... <laughs> is that his porn a, name incredible. or his real name? <laughs> You'd think, right? Yeah. I mean, and he has slick back hair and he has this sort of gravelly voice and he's an amazing, amazing guy. And he hmm. was one of the shooters uh, slash directors on the job. And he says, um, uh, you know, there's not a week that goes by that I don't think about that job. Huh. You know, which to to say that about a and these are you know he's a guy who makes like Nike commercials and stuff. I mean he's a professional commercial director, and to reference that as being this sort of like apocalyptic, <laughs> and to know that in the moment they shoot. were probably so miserable, but had zero idea that this would be one of the most memorable experiences of their, of their life. life, and they probably yeah. just hated hated themselves in those those days working they, with that guy. They definitely did not like him, and it was a miserable job. And they they laugh. It, it was interesting to get them all together because they hadn't seen. Each other in a long time, and hmm. and so they were all telling stories about how, um, you know, they can be like in Tokyo or something shooting a commercial, and nobody recognizes them for anything they've ever done. But if they mention, oh, we were on the crew that shot Winnebago, man, people want to get their pictures taken with them, and they wow. sign autographs, and like totally surreal. Well, what an achievement for you because you actually did find Jack and you did interview him, and it reminded me a little bit when I was watching the film as my brother had recommended it to me, was, I don't know if there's a, a documentary called Don't You Forget About Me, I think, and it's about mm -hmm. the search, for, it's a group of, uh, of ki you know, young guys. They go out looking for John Hughes. They're a huge oh, John yeah, Hughes fans, yeah. and they basically drive to his house. It's all about their search to get an interview with him. And they mm -hmm. interview a lot of people, Judd Nelson, Ali Sheedy. They get a lot of commentary. It's all about the A's. And, but ultimately, they never get him. They get to his house. He never comes out. He never, they, they send him the movie. He never even sees it. So mm -hmm. there's, it's like a little bit unsatisfying. What's great about your film is you do get him. You do find him, and you actually have a few encounters. In the first one, he seems like a very serene, quiet, almost broken man that is um, downright remorseful, and you find out later that he was tricking you. Mm -hmm. Did you have any idea in that moment that he might be playing you? No, and I get that question a lot when people say, like, how could you not know? You know? But... You have to keep in mind the, the setup, which is, you know, I was just getting to know this person, and I was a huge fan. So mm -hmm. to me, it was almost like I was meeting, you know, one of the found footage guys in the movie says, this is a holy grail, holy grail for us. It's like meeting Harrison Ford or a movie star, because we've seen your clip so many times. And I felt a little bit like that, meeting Jack Rebney. 
And you know, he he lives in this cabin that I don't know if you can tell from the footage is in the middle. It of It looked nowhere. like you were in the middle of nowhere. I mean, his nearest neighbors are two miles. So it's believable away. that he sort of became a recluse and was a quiet old man living in a cabin. Right. Well, and the first part of that sentence is still true. He's a recluse, <laughs> but I didn't know what kind of old man he'd become. And he put on this sort of benevolent, everything is okay. Ha <laughs> ha Isn't that funny that this video is out there? Sort of face, and I didn't know enough to. To question just, it. To question and how, it. frankly, insulting would it have been if you did and he was this guy? Right. You know, I mean, what are you supposed to be like, oh, come on, be, be a jerk to me? Like, you want him to perform and be an angry man? Sure, and it sort of, you know, it challenged my assumptions about, you know, what right I had to be there and, like, asking him these sort of personal questions or asking him, you know, what this event must be like for him because mm -hmm. it, in some ways it's reliving a painful experience. Right. And, it was it was interesting um, for me as a filmmaker in that way, and and also I th I'm working on a new film that's about a, a con man, and one of the things that con men say is that it's remarkably easy to fool people hmm. because we never expect that we're being fooled. You know, True. we have this sort of social contract that like you and I are just meeting for the first time, right? And so everything coming out of my mouth, right I just now, take yes, we I believe take, everything you say, yeah, right, until there's a reason not to, mm -hmm. right? And I just had no reason. Not well, then to he does it. call you. And <laughs> And says, you know, basically that he tricked you. So mm -hmm. how did that make you feel? Were you angry? Were you embarrassed that you hadn't picked up on it? What was that phone call like? Um, well, I think it was more like uh, the Oscar Wilde quote, which is like, be careful what you wish for. And that was absolutely how I felt because once the floodgates were open and he was ranting and telling me, like, no, this is this is what I really think, it was this earful that... I wanted in theory, mm. but suddenly was going to have to do it. Wanted in theory, you mean for the film, for the benefit of the movie, making it more dramatic? Well, like as a fan, like, uh -huh. oh, it'd be so funny to hear him rant about stuff, but then to actually have that be a part of my everyday life, mm -hmm. was, you know, and, ask, and invite that in was, um, was something that. I wanted but wasn't sure I was prepared for when I got it, you hmm. know, and, and that's, I think, part of the fun of watching the movie is that you go on this journey of getting to know Jack Rebney. Because you're getting to, uh, at the same pace that you are. Exactly, mm -hmm. along with me. It's like this adventure that we go on together, mm -hmm. and, and um, you know, hindsight being twenty twenty, I realized that I'm a surrogate for this audience that he didn't know he had, and initially was distrustful of, mm -hmm. and and uh, scornful about. So his reaction to me is really his reaction to this whole phenomenon. Right. I know for me it was frustrating and, you know, credit to you for really pushing him, but you, you really feel, in learning about this man, well, you want to know the root of his anger. What happened to this guy that made him so angry? And you push him. You try to ask him about his childhood, his marriage, and he will not give up anything. He will not open up to you. So if I'm frustrated as a viewer, I can only imagine how frustrating it must have been for you. And and how how far did you try to push it? And did you ever find out anything that is not in the movie about you know aside from Dick Cheney, who he seemed to like to blame for everything? Why is he so mad? Well, that's interesting. Did you feel frustrated? I was very frustrated. Really? Although I was really glad that you were hammering away at him, like that you tried. But mm -hmm. I, it was, it was because in a very Hollywood way, in a, in a non-documentary, but you know, in the structure of a movie, you need to know why people do the things they do. Mm -hmm. So you're waiting for that payoff, which is, I'm angry because my wife cheated on me, or you just want some justification for his behavior, and you never get it. Mm -hmm. So unless you're hiding something from me, I want to know why he's so mad. No, but it's interesting, right? I mean, just the way you described it, like it's this Hollywood notion of like, I need to boil it down to why he's so angry. Mm -hmm. And I think that notion right there is what he was resisting. And for me, as a young filmmaker, um, and particularly a docu documentary filmmaker, if you ask somebody intensely about themselves, you know, and often if there's a camera there, they open up to you no problem. Mm -hmm. And when I went up there and first started talking with Jack, he immediately turned, turned this around on me and said, like, what makes you think that I want to divulge any personal details to you. You know, I'm I'm an old man, I've been burned publicly, mm -hmm. and I used to work in media, and I can understand how things get taken out of context. And he's also from a generation of um, 
media makers like Ed Murrow and Eric Severide, where it's not about who you are as a person. It's about the news that you deliver and, and sort of the way you carry yourself mm -hmm. and the work that you do that you should be judged on. Um, and so he doesn't, he doesn't see any value in um, exposing his personal details. And that's what you see us fighting about in the film. When I say, you know, people are only going to want to hear about your political beliefs if you open up and talk about your backstory and get people to trust you and like you, then you can then impart whatever it is you want to impart. And so, and we're fighting all throughout the movie. And one of my favorite things about what happens plot-wise is that we both are right at the end, mm -hmm. you know? Like, through the experience of watching the movie and getting to know Jack in a similar way to, to my relationship with him, you like him enough to really care what he has to say. And so at the end, when he sort of delivers this political diatribe, it's this, like, triumphant moment. Um, and then he's right in that people really did want to hear what it was that he had to say. Because they actually cared about him. Yeah, yeah. so it's like this kind of nice... Um, uh, coming together of those two ideas, but um, also I really was resistant of wanting because that was my intention. Like I wanted to get up there and like find out the inciting right. incident. Of, Why? Like, What's, what made yeah. him mm -hmm. the angriest man in the world? But like you know, you can't. I, I wonder if in your life you can point to something that's like, right. this is what's made me who I am. Mm -hmm. This is the defining moment. Mm -hmm. And I felt like it was too tempting and maybe too easy to do that. And by by not giving an easy answer, it forces the audience to think even more and like sort of meet him halfway and I, and hopefully like him even more as a character. A little bit more, you do. You, you do come around. Um, well, the movie got you a lot of attention, so much so that you actually went on The Tonight Show with Jay Leno. I think yeah. we have a photo of your appearance. What, I'll look at you in your khakis. Um, <laughs> look at how we're sitting in the exact same position, Jack and there I. There you Isn't go. Oh, it's like, you and your it's mentor. Like before and after or something like that. <laughs> what was that? Was that a surreal experience for you? I mean, it had to have been a thrill. It was unbelievable. Um, but, you know, strangely, I was I was prepped for it, which I know sounds bizarre, but I, I have a really great story. We we were in uh, Traverse City, Michigan, which is uh, Michael Moore's film festival, where that takes place. Uh -huh. And we were at this after party, and there were probably a few hundred people there. And this woman I'd never seen before and haven't seen since, uh, middle aged with sort of dark curly hair, locks eyes on me from like way across this big. We we're in a parking lot outside. And she comes up to me, and I sort of notice her because she's like got this really strange look on her face. And she comes up and she just grabs my hand, right? And it was just so unusual and natural that I was just sort of like, oh, I just kind of went with it. And she goes, she just started talking. She said, um, um, you're really close with your mother. You really need to take care of your feet, and you're going to be on The Tonight Show. And I went, excuse me, what? what? And, and right before I walked into the party, I had been on the phone with my mom. Right, strangely, because uh -huh. I'm like I'm close with her, but it was like weird that she brought that up. I had just bought new shoes and I had blisters on my feet, and they were killing me. Right, and nobody else knew that but me because I was wearing these new shoes. And then the Tonight Show thing, and I was like, "This is one of the weirdest things ever." And I'm and I said, "Who are you? What are you talking about?" And she goes, "I." I'm she dropped my hand and said, I'm really sorry. I just sometimes get these premonitions and I wow. like it's like a radio signal and I just sort of say things and I don't really know what I'm saying and I saw you and I just had to come over and say that and she turned around and left. I was gonna say you need to find that woman and make a documentary about her. Maybe wow. that's my next film, I don't know. But and it was, so you were then on the Tonight Show. And then that was cut to a year, year and a half later and we were on the Tonight Show. Yeah. Did you have fun? Was it was it scary? It, you know, it wasn't. And a lot of people asked huh. me that, and they said, "Like, were, were you nervous?" That and, would I, be and I sincerely wasn't nervous. Did I, you feel like maybe it was more Jack? Like you were there, but you were supporting Jack, and it was his. Oh, it's always his show. <laughs> it's always his show. Yeah, I, yeah. we. Uh, you know, he's the pony, and I'm the dog in our mm -hmm. little dog and pony routine. Um, but no, they take such great care of you, and Jay Leno is a sincerely really nice person who puts you right at ease, mm -hmm. and, um, you know, I mean, there are lots of people and lots of lights, and but but it was just such a, a, a machine, but also such a, like, an interesting, fun experience yeah. that, that I wasn't nervous, and... I don't know. I even got a couple of good one-liners well, He there. let you talk. I'm surprised. <laughs> um, when you make a documentary, I know there's so much footage that you have to go through. Is there anything you left on the cutting room floor that you wish had been in the movie or was painful uh, for you to cut? Oh, that's a good question. Um, well, there are Easter eggs on our DVD menu, these little hidden scenes. Uh -huh. um, 
<laughs> and I think they're like two or three of the best things in the movie. And unfortunately, we had uh, to cut them out because it just didn't work. And uh, we had this sort of addendum to the ending at one point, um, which for those of you who've seen the movie, we are driving back out of San Francisco in the minivan. And it's uh, I'm driving and Jack and his best friend Keith are in the back of the minivan. And um, it's about a three and a half hour drive back up to his cabin. And we've just had this incredible experience and Jack is very quiet. And uh, all of a sudden Keith says something like, you know, you should sing, we should sing the Good Morning Jack Rebney song. And I go, what, what is, what's this? And Keith starts teaching me the lyrics, which are good morning, good morning, Jack Rebney, prepare to start the day. Good morning, good morning, Rebney, we'll have oats along the way. Right, it's the song they sing to each uh -huh. other. Totally random. Yeah. So I start singing it, right? And we're singing it to each other. And, and Jack start, just cuts me off, and he's not singing. Mm -hmm. And he says, Ben, if you're going to sing it, sing it right. And I was like, well, you do it for me then. And it was just this amazing moment where it was almost like a Mel Brooks movie. Like, they just, on cue, drop mm -hmm. into this, like, rendition, Jack huh. and Keith, of, of <laughs> Good Morning, Good Morning, Jack Rebney. And next thing you know, we're all singing in the minivan, driving back up the mountain, Good Morning, Jack Rebney. And it's, so it's this, like, lovely little 30-second clip of a Good little of DVD extra for everybody. In the minivan, so check it out. What's, uh, when people know that you're the guy that made the movie about the Winnebago Man, what's the one question you feel like you get the most what do people want to know about him well i mean the most generic one is like how's jack how's he doing or have you kept in touch yeah we talk on the phone every day do you yes. you talk to jack more than you talk to your own mother yes unbelievable i know and we sort of jokingly refer to the film as um can you guys bleep things yeah oh show? it's the internet you can say whatever you want okay as a uh, uh, tuesdays with maury mm -hmm. crossed with shit my dad says and huh. it totally feels like that where i have this like 81 year old blind <laughs> hermit for uh, like a mentor who is just kind of swearing a blue streak at me most of the time you know wow. um, but but he's great and he um, he really has you know turned out to be this like good friend of mine and this person in my life that is you know unusual and um, and he knows that I'm I'm out here and and is excited that I'm in LA and I'm um, uh, working on a bunch of new film projects, and so and he's like give, giving me advice about him. It's totally surreal that I'm now friends with. That is the Winnebago crazy. Man. Well, hopefully he has iTunes and he can download our little show and see you. Um, <laughs> hi, Jack. Uh, well, tell us what can we look forward to. What what is your next uh, your next movie? Well, I've got um, three things in the works, um, and what I'm what I'm really interested in doing is uh, making comedy narratives now. So um, I am working on a film about um, getting conned by a con man, which is started actually as a documentary setup that's taking more of kind of a fictional turn. Um, then I'm working on a um, scripted comedy called Quickie with uh, my friend in Austin named Bob Byington. Mm -hmm. and, um, and then we're also working to uh, turn Winnebago Man into a kind of half hour sort of eastbound and down style show. Ah, that, for HBO or you don't know where? We don't know where yet. Is that but, why you're uh, out here in LA? Yes, it is. Interesting. Yeah. Who would you love to see cast as Jack Rebney? We talked about this a lot during editing and um, it's changed actually. Mm -hmm. um, from then, I um, naturally thought of Sean Connery, Dabney Coleman. Mm. If you want to get really outside of the box, somebody like Delroy Lindo. Oh, wow. Outside of the box. Okay. Yeah. Um, but now I'm thinking that Michael Keaton. Michael would be Keaton. The Interesting. Jack Rebney. I thought you were going to say Alec Baldwin, but I guess it's just because I'm or, so used to watching that. Or like, Alec, kind of. Alec Baldwin would be equally amazing. Interesting. Yeah. Oh, I look forward to that. Um, yeah, you would definitely have to go cable because you need to be able to swear all the time. All the time. All yes. the time. <laughs> um, well, best of luck. Thank you so much for yeah. coming. Really, really nice to meet you. Well, um, thanks for having me. That is our show for tonight, guys. Thank you for tuning into This Week in Movies. I'm Farrell Roth. You can follow me on Twitter at Miss Frothy. You can follow Lon, of course, at Lon's. And Ben, are you on Twitter? I am on Twitter. It's Ben Steinbauer. Ben Steinbauer. Ben Steinbauer. Super easy and simple. Uh, we also invite you to check out all the other This Week in content on our YouTube channel, which is youtube.com backslash This Week In. And um, we hope you guys all have a great week. And please join us again next Sunday night again at our new time, 6 o'clock. Have a great week, guys. That's a wrap.